Everybody, welcome back to Final Residence TV and episode number 21 of Van Halen Stories. Season two, my first guest is Brian Tishy. Uh, most of you know Brian Tishy. If you're listening to rock music right now, you know about the Dead Daisies, of course, with, with Doug Aldrich and uh, Glenn Hughes, of course, the legendary Glenn Hughes, which is your current gig. You were in Europe just, what, a few weeks ago? Come, Yeah, okay. yeah. Um, did a two-week UK run and including uh, Ireland. Yeah, up to, got home December 17th. Yeah, that, we finished up the year over there. That was great. You uh, <laughs> played with Lynch Mob, right? Is, or you played with Lynch at some point? Yeah, yeah. I've done over a bunch of years. We've done very, a few different projects uh, together, uh, you know, including Lynch Mob and um, oh, a couple Sweet Lynch records, Michael Sweet and George right, Lynch. Right, right. Yeah, myself stuff. and James Lomenzo played on. Mm -hmm. uh yeah there, it's uh stuff with uh with george and jeff wilson there's something called i think heavy hitters a bunch of cover songs we did a couple records of that it's cool is i want to get into a little bit of um uh, once we talk about eddie in the early form you know the early years you know george and him and randy were kind of the guys in, in la and you've had yeah. the, kind of the fortune of being on stage with 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 eddie and with george uh of course not with randy but you were in ozzy for a period too what, what when was that exactly that, that period? uh 2000 Ozfest. okay um yeah that summer did that tour can't just state mention that without you know mentioning how awesome that was what an experience you know and yeah that was really that's one of those things um to where you you know if you told me the kid who's <laughs> right. in Wizard of Oz or, or sabbath eight tracks <laughs> or uh you know diary or it's Speak of the devil, whatever. Just go down the list, man. You know, sure. and you, could, you know, someday you're going to be on that stage playing those songs, playing War Pigs, going <laughs> with uh, like, come on, that was yeah, that's that was huge. That was awesome. And you're doing it. <laughs> you're playing after Pantera. <laughs> oh, wow, man. Yeah, man. So that, that was crazy, that was right? Summer. Yeah, White Snake, of course, for for a good while there. Uh, Billy Idol, you played with for a number of years. Uh, I read. Yeah. And Foreigner, of course, um, offline we were talking about Slash and Snake Pit, which is where we have a common friend with Eric Dover, and yep. uh, and Eric was a local guy in my Birmingham, Alabama scene, along with Damon Johnson, who we were talking about earlier too. And you know, you said seventy nine. This is in another interview. Seventy nine Dynasty Tour Kiss was your first concert. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. And there was two nights, and I can't remember which night, uh, but uh, Ron. Thal Bumblefoot was there, yeah, as, yeah. as was Eddie Trunk. <laughs> you know, we were all at the <laughs> not at Madison Square Garden. I, the, Eddie knows the night. Eddie knows which night he was there. I don't know if I have the ticket stub, which I should because I have a lot of ticket stubs. But at its, when I was living in my basement in New Jersey, when I had my drums and uh, I took over the basement, I had a bed there. There was a flood in our basement, and underneath my bed, I had stored all my like a bunch of kiss memorabilia but i just put it in like a regular cardboard box uh christmas box actually it was like or a clothes box you know something you give up so it wasn't even a thick box and that flood just trashed everything and i think that ticket was in there so i can't remember exactly which uh which um night but yeah it was amazing dynasty massive square garden um uh, 79 that was that was massive uh as a first concert to go to that was just a stupid experience soon to be followed by the next two ma like step talking 79 i was 11 you know then it was a couple years later saw rush and then i saw van halen diver down and that oh my i was so because see how i'm doing i'm getting this back into van halen here man that was uh i was so so psyched for van halen that was the band then like because like i think i saw i heard you say you got into them during fair warning because you saw i heard so, so your video. Clip, you saw i, I saw what the, was it don unchained Kirshner. on the, yeah don Kirshner. the unchained clip which yeah when they put that mtv when, when that would come on that was still like a live van halen board mix whatever that means at the time but it sounds it's not a boot like this is a this is pro shot it was the best and uh yeah so i got into them during fair warning as well i, I and, and i'll tell you why uh, maybe people can relate to this as Van Halen fans. Like, I know everybody's like, dude, I heard Running with the Devil, then I heard, you know, Eruption, and you really got me. Into the whole side one is just a blitz. It's just undeniable. Right. But I'm buying magazines, and I'm, you know, you know, I'm like 10 years old. What do you know at 10 years old in the late 70s when you're, you know, you only know what you can, 
you don't really know much. I just know Kiss, really. And uh, I start seeing magazines, Van Halen, the next Kiss, and I'm like, Kiss is the coolest. They got the makeup. They're they're superheroes. Van Halen's just like, uh, and and I'm going Van Morrison. I knew there's a Van Morrison, so I'm not even like, <laughs> is the guy's first name Van? Who's Van? Is the singer the Van Halen guy? Like, is he Van Halen? I don't I get this yet. I but pronounce me. I am I'm listening on the radio to the Cradle of Rock. All right. So now that's that's eighty. So I'm like twelve. So at that point, I hadn't been exposed. But I'm like, that's a badass song. Who is that? Is that like Derringer? Is that like I don't know who what band this is. I just hear it on the radio. But yeah, man. Uh, so I was behind. But that was also because at the time, my first song I heard, knowing Van Halen, go, oh, they're the next like biggest thing. They're the next Kiss, and I just didn't know. And I had no friends around that played me Van Halen. You know what I mean? I had other friends playing other stuff. Sure. But um, first song I heard was uh, on the radio was "Dance the Night Away," and it's poppy, and it's major, and it's happy, and it's singy. There's no shred guitars. There's no guitar solo barely. I mean, is there? There's a drop down the middle and there's a pretty tapping thing. Uh, I thought it was, I was like, this isn't, this isn't like, it's just not, first of all, that's one side of Van Halen, but it is probably outside up to that point, the most poppy song that and Jamie's crying, right? Like right. for up to, and then women and children first in the cradle of rock was, that was tough. Every, everybody wants some is, just rowdy, uh, take your whiskey home, you know, then you get to, they didn't really have a pop song until they, so this is love, you know what I mean? Mean Streets is tough, Unchained is tough. So, mm -hmm. so this is love is a little more radio friendly, right? So there's only a few of those type of songs in those first four records. So my first one that I was like, this is Van Halen, was Dance Tonight Away. I was like, that's not, freaking, that's not like love going, da -ga -da -ga, da -ga -da -ga, da -ga -da -ga. you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm like, doo -doo -ba -da -da -da. <laughs> so anyways it didn't sell me on them yet but then fair warning came out and um i was just like okay fair warning was out but it wasn't even that record it was at the end of i think seventh grade went to a party and i hear in the cradle rock and I'm like that song's badass what is this they're playing the record but i'm just and i stopped i remember standing there in the backyard around this pool party and everybody wants them came on and the tribal drums and then all Eddie, eddie's noises and the power chords, and they just kick. I everything about it floored me. That goes into that goes into Fools. It goes into Rom Romeo Delight. So they played the side one. Mm -hmm. I it just stopped me. I was like, "What is this?" Somebody goes, "Van Halen, Van Halen, Women and Children First. I was like, "Oh my god, oh my god!" Like that floored me, and um, that's what that's what stopped me in my tracks and got me into them. And then I immediately got Fair Warning. A buddy of mine had Women and Children First on cassette. It was a guitar player buddy that I would go over there and he had his Les Paul and he had his Marshall and he had magazines of, with Eddie on the cover and he had all the records, he had the Rush and the Van Halen and I'd sit there making set copies and looking at his magazines, his record covers, he'd show me a blues scale, he'd show me, you know, Back in Black, Iron Man, uh, uh, Paranoid, uh, a whole lot, not a whole lot of loves, there's something else, I can't remember what. Um, all this killer stuff, oh, Smoke on the Water, of course, but he was, you know, very instrumental in hooking me up with a lot of knowledge at that time. So anyways, that was all during Fair Warning. All this hit me at once. So, but, right. so I'm a diver down guy. I am like so pumped for the next record. I don't, I, and I, I defend Diver Down to all my Van Halen friends. I like, dude, Diver Down. I'm like, no, dude, I'll go down at top to bottom. I will defend every song on that record. I love right it. I, 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 I love the production. Eddie's guitar tone is insane. He's playing amazing. Uh, Alex sounds phenomenal. Dave's still Dave. The harmonies are still the harmonies. Uh, where have all the good times gone? Is that not a great? I think it's better than the Kinks version. Pound for pound, didn't they oh, change yeah. the riff? It, I, I don't even know oh, it. Uh, yeah. yeah. I, I'm playing in a half step down in the, in B, right? A A B B B A. <laughs> I don't know if that's right. That's yeah, I've never that's tried right. to learn that song. Yeah. But like, dude. That's a kill. As soon as I heard them, I'm like, all right, that's a cover. That sounds like Van Halen to me. That's 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 like a Van Halen song to me. Hang them high. You want? We can do a whole thing on Diver Down. I'll defend <laughs> Diver Down. Um, I love Secrets. I love Intruder. I love it, Pretty Woman Fine. It's a great. It's a great single. I mean, come on. It's a popular side. It's Dance the Night Away. It's Jamie's Crying. It's Pretty Woman. That world of Van Halen. Um, every, every I think everybody's let down by uh, Dance in the Streets, right? Everybody's like. Uh, but I'm like, listen to the synth track. Yeah, it's, it, it's so badass. Listen to Alex's drum groove. Listen to the cowbell overdub. Listen to the guitar solo. 
Dave's attitude, the harmonies, it's so Van Halen. Then you get one of my favorite songs in the world, the little guitars intro, which is insane because now Eddie's going, oh yeah, I'm speed picking on one string and I'm doing the thing on the, you know, the tapping the other one. It's brilliant. It's still Eddie breaking ground. I'm just trying to in, in, you know, um, imitate a, a flamingo player. I know it's flamingo. Right. But then you go to little guitars. Is th on a little guitar. I didn't know it at the time. I'm like, this is like another amazing riff of Eddie that sounds like nobody else. Full bug, uh, Big Bad Bill. Come on, man. And they end it classic with, with uh, that's the whole record right happy there. With, trails. Uh, with yeah. Happy Trails. Come yeah. on, man. You got, you got Jan Van Halen kicking butt. Like, you're get, bringing your dad on the record, man. On a, It's a good song. It's classic. But you already had um, Women and Children First. Um, yeah. um, could this be magic? Right. Jeez. Could this be magic? Anyways, I'm saying that's not that far away from a Big Bad Bill. In, this sure. is, or the or an Ice Cream Man intro. You know what I mean? This is like, that's the side of Van Halen. Like, the breakdown and I'm the one. Well, who, sure. what other, like... Hard rock metal bands do breakdowns like I'm the one. That's so, you know what I mean? It's like, do but yeah, don't you think like Roth had so much to do with those particular songs and, and, and his his whole, you know, uh, the kind of stuff he listened to brought that, yeah. that vibe in? Dude, I'm so, I, whenever, when somebody goes, I, you know, because that's what everybody heard, oh, dude, David Roth, he's just, you know, he's just a great front man. He's not, not much of a singer. I'm like, really? Somebody else sing a Van Halen. You sing me Van Halen one. Go ahead. Give me, give me the uh, ad libs and run with the devil. Give me the screams. It is. You got James Brown, Steven Tyler, mm -hmm. um, Ian Gillen, David Lee Roth. As far as screams, as far as like, I mean, you got some blood curdling uh, Jim Morrison and even some some insane Chris Cornell. But I'm saying that David Lee Roth scream. I don't. There's no sound on <laughs> rock records like that. There's like James Brown and and. Uh, David Lee Roth, that is, we take that shit for granted. Yeah. Hey, like, you just take it for granted because it's so big. It's just like we've heard it for so long. That, sh that stuff's amazing. His blues voice, his the whiskey drenched voice, the, you know, the rasp, mm -hmm. the, the personality. The, Dave is amazing. I don't want to hear anybody else sing the, any of those songs. The, come on, who's going to sing the intro of Ice Cream Man, intro of Take Your Whiskey Home? Who's going to do, who's going to make up something over a lost control? Like, right, you know what right, I mean, right. and it's still Van Halen. They still got you know, bam, 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 bam. They still got harmonies in there with Michael. That's it's what, all brilliant. And yeah, Dave. That Dave blew me is, away, man. That's what blew yeah. me away about Roth is that you know you, the the beds of music that would, Eddie would give him were like insane to come up with great melodies over. Because when you hear him, you know, soloed or whatever, you're like, damn, how did he come up with that melody? That that poppy melody yeah. line over that. There's some. There's some radical like chord changes in some of these eddie parts like like in in a <laughs> dirty movies it's just not normal some of the structures like this the riff writing and going from this part to that even like the intro of fear about later which i know dave doesn't sing over but your guitar player and for your, all you guitar geeks as you know it's you know it's it's the main riffs in a but when he goes to that b section before the band kicks in he goes mm -hmm. down to the f i know we're half down whatever and there's a drop d in there he gives you this f chord and um, then he goes down to the E flat. Mm -hmm. Dude, that's some dark shit. That's like, you're an A and you go to this A, but it sounds normal, but it sounds, it, that's what, there's just those little things Eddie puts twists and turns in. Um, mm -hmm. Or that Black Sabbath side of an <coughs> intruder or the intro of a, or Tora Tora. Like there's some obvious, I, you know, cause he loved, I, I don't, I don't want to say, I don't know Eddie, like I know what he loved and didn't, but I've heard he was, and you can hear Sabbath, influence you know sure, sure. um but man uh d d you had eddie doing all this right and amazing riffs also a popular side of things and then you have dave uh, putting his 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 lyrics and melodies on top of this it was Dave's, a man, it was genius, mean, man. The, the the combination of their 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 um like you said eddie's unconventional structures with the, the the lyrical, I mean, even Dave's stuff is un. I mean, take the the vocal on Unchained, you know, as they're as they're coming up before the chorus, you know, the back and forth between the A and all that. Yeah. That that is such a weird musical piece there, and yeah. he's able to make it into some kind of singy thing that you just. <laughs> no, it, it's I, I. That's why Van Halen's huge. It's not just because. 
it's a great band with cool riffs or whatever. It's you have to have these. I, I like who, as far as I know, those choruses and those lyrics, whether it's the simplicity, that's the perfect chorus. And he talked about love. When Eddie comes in, he goes, boom, boom, bam, it gives you this amazing riff, and it goes, A, A, G, C, B. And, and you go, Hey, talking about love. But there's nothing better there. That's it. That's a done deal. And the whole song is eight, it's just one part, the whole song. You know, it's just you go right, verse, right. chorus, verse, chorus, solo right. over it, mel melodic solo, which is brilliant, nice melody. And yeah. breakdown chorus out, hey, 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 uh, like that. And I know that was kind of them, they're more or less a little bit of a punk side or whatever. But right. Dave had somebody had to come up with that phrase. Ain't talking about love is tough. You know right. what I mean? That's just a hook. As soon as you say that phrase, and you hear where it's placed, and it's one, you know, with Michael's awesome harmony on top. I think, is it, is Eddie singing on that one too? You know, because Eddie, I never, I don't want to forget to give Eddie credit on his backgrounds because he is as solid as Michael. It's the blend. It's sure. a beautiful blend. It's just so it's so smooth and it's always on. And Eddie was always on backgrounds. All the stuff he was doing on guitar always nailed his backgrounds. And so did Mike. Yeah. But you think about that was, like uh, think about dancing that away. You were mentioning this earlier. Um, when they're doing those parts, you know, they're doing three part at times when Eddie and, and Mike are doing their parts, and then Dave will thread another part over the top of their parts it's just really yeah. i mean when you do these songs you realize you go oh crap this is a lot more work than i thought it was gonna be. <laughs> you know, and that and, and that like you know maybe the who did a bit because townsend and, and and whistle would sing but yeah. that's a whole other color when you have a band that's basically you know which there are tons of um uh like okay the stones you know there's not maybe outside of background vocals that they record, um, it's more about Mick. You know, Van Halen was guaranteed could have choruses with that big harmony color, that background harmony color. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, whereas like Zeppelin didn't, you know, you didn't hear much harmony in the vocals on Zeppelin. Didn't matter, obviously they're the biggest band in the world, but it's just a really nice color um, to to have. And it really made them stand. So they'd be playing some really heavy stuff and they'd still give you these, you know, some a lot of its major choruses a lot of it's like you know run with the devil and uh um you know jamie's crying but even unchained i mean it's a it's a it's it's a major into a minor chorus but i'm saying it gives you that major lift even though it's tough and it's just heavy and i was gonna ask uh, you if you've seen that video there was a guy there i don't know i forgot what his channel was but he did a breakdown on this part of how he would how these these major lifts that you're talking about would insert into every song very similarly and he would also talk about how he'd break the bridges down you know to these unconventional kind of things like in jump where you go to this weird combination of rhythm and chordal structure it's just just like what is that in the middle of that you know in the middle of this c major <laughs> thing yeah yeah, I mean, jump is mostly a major thing but what, what's so great is jump he could have almost just had the intro riff mm -hmm. which is the verse which is the chorus, you could almost just have that B section and call it a song. He could have soloed over the chorus and done a chorus out. That could have been, it's still probably been a number one. He gave you, you know, or done the solo back to the B and the chorus out. It could have been that simple. He gives you a guitar solo modulation change into a whole mini epic keyboard solo right, that right. comes out with its own do 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 Like it's, that's not pop song writing there. That's like another level. That's like he already had the winning riff. He did, and Dave Dave goes, "Oh, that's your riff. What do you? What should we do with it?" He's now he's got a job to do. We got a big he, he Dave. I don't know how he thought, but it's like to come up with might as well jump jump. He was probably like, "Let's not get in the way of this really hooky, um, huge, uh, memorable keyboard riff. Let's just that's it. Let's not get in the way." He really kept it sparse. And, yeah, uh, he actually it, went, it worked out. He put out a thing yesterday. Roth did, a, you know, his Roth shows that he does, where he just kind of talks randomly about all kinds of things. And he, he they I listened to some of it. He brings Somebody up sent it to me. I, I, yeah. He brings up jump, and he goes, he plays me the riff for jump, and I say no, <laughs> no. <laughs> he said, "You got to get, you know, how he kind of come around to it, but." But yeah, I mean, you know that that you're right. The riff was very powerful, and uh, it, it's just amazing the stuff. You know, your Van Halen interactions with Eddie himself, 
And, um, you know, the, any stories that go behind all this, because I don't, you know, I haven't heard you talk about these. Uh, I don't think at all that maybe you have, but I, I dug around, you know, Eric Dover, our common friend that you were in Slash and Snake Pit with, uh, yep. and yourself. And I, I heard it was through Slim Jim Phantom that he got the call. Um, but can you walk me through this whole thing? Like from the very beginning of when you find out you're going to end up there the whole day that you're there. And of course, playing with it, playing with Eddie, uh, the, the house, the, I mean, the details, the stuff that, you know, crazy fans would love to go through the gate and see at, at the, the mansion. Uh, man, it's you, you, I'm just, anybody that is like too jammed with Eddie, you in his backyard, you're at his house, like, but you blow, it, even though I can sit here and say, yeah, I did that. Like I, I, there was a part of me that was like, yeah, I'm going to kick ass on drums and I'm going to become really good friends with Eddie. And he's going to always want to jam me. You know what I mean? <laughs> Who doesn't want that? Right? Like, cause he made a comment to me. He goes, Oh, Alex, you know, he doesn't really come around and jam much. And I was like, dude, here's my phone number. You want, to jam, you want a drummer? And he, oh, yeah, cool, man. Yeah, he puts it. But it's like, I was like, I don't know how long it lasted. Will he call today? Will he want to jam with me? You know, <laughs> because it's freaking Eddie Van Halen. It's just, but yeah, man. For me, that was it. Was it was so massive? I couldn't. I could not take in the amount of things that were going on. I couldn't take it all in. This was not one day, dude. This is two. Okay, okay? because we rehearsed the night before. That okay. was better than the show because nobody was there. Just like when I did a uh, Barbados a benefit show with with steven tyler and joe perry we rehearsed the day before that was better better than the show the show was like okay the pressure's on you got to play good it, what no the rehearsals with your freaking idols are always better than the show because everybody's more chill and you can interact and you're you're it's a whole different way of relating on a music musical level and on a personal level you don't have the pressure of Time to go on, guys. We're performing, performing. Next song. This is a whole different thing. So, um, but we, there was this band. Slim Jim Phantom has the Cat Club in uh, in in West Hollywood uh, for many years. Um, I don't think it's there now, but for a lot of years. And there was a lot of jams going on there. A lot of different players. Um, you know, it's, it's just, but I think the core at one time was like Slim Jim Phantom and um, Gilby Clark. Um, and there was just tons of musicians, and sometimes you'd hear, "Oh, Bruce, Bruce Dickinson popped in, or Brian May popped in." When I was doing it, Billy Idol came down. You know, it's like, and and Eric Dover, Eric was always there, and the bass player Stefan Adika. So it was like that, that was kind of the core. John Karabi, Dizzy Dizzy Reed, those were the cores. I'd say like Eric Dover, Stefan Adika on bass, um, Eric Singer was there a lot. Um, I was on drums. Slim Jim, if Slim, yeah, you know, Slim Jim was on drums. But anyways, there was there were, for a while there it was it was like whatever night every Tuesday night or whatever Monday night it was you know packed it was a small place. Somehow one of these nights, which this was two thousand six, right. it was right. There's a two thousand six. We were playing at the the Cat Club, and I don't know Matt Bruck, but Matt and I were at Berkeley College of Music together. I think for nineteen eighty six, my first year there, and okay. when I went back the next year people going like I remember he was maybe a little older than me so and you know next year I hear Matt Brock you know man Matt, Matt Brock he moved to LA he's teching for Eddie Van Halen like what how, how did he get even into the world of Eddie Van Halen and he's been there since right, right. right so I saw him he shows up at the cat club uh maybe with his girlfriend maybe she told him to come. i can't remember why there was something going on but he and i think his girlfriend at the time show up um he sees us play i think we said hi and i don't know if i said dude i used to know who you were because i don't even know knew if we knew each other then i just knew his name mm -hmm. but uh it was soon after that might have been that week that basically he saw us play and then eddie goes hey man i did music for this adult film and I want to have the party in my backyard we need a band because Matt just happened to see us he said I think his girlfriend said hey Matt you should come down and check out this band Starfucker you know let's go there tonight so that may have been how it happened right. so he goes to Eddie hey I just saw this band the Starfuckers down at this uh 
um, this club that Slim Jim Phantom owns that it's guys got guys from Billy Idol and Guns N' Roses and you know Alice Cooper or whatever. It's got all these guys and they jam. It's a bunch of rock covers. So Eddie was like, yeah, cool. They're hired. They're it. That was it. So that's, that's how I think it came to be. Somebody, I don't know if somebody called Slim Jim. It might have been. And then Slim Jim called Stefan, the bass player, and Stefan called me. But when they told me, I was like, you know, it was like two weeks from now, whatever, two, three weeks, you're, you're going to be at his house band at his party, his backyard. And I was just like, <laughs> Come on. How many, times, you know, how many times we've all driven up Coldwater Canyon? That's Eddie Van Hillen's house. You know what I mean? That's, that's the driveway. Right. You know what I mean? Like, you're telling me I get to go there? Oh, and, and because I, he wanted Billy Idol to jam with us. Like, that was part of it, too. Was, you know, I played with Billy, and Billy was going to jam, right? Well, that didn't happen, but Billy was there at the rehearsal the night before. But, um, I think we all know that this was during Eddie's more or less, you know, darker period, right? right? right. And it was just, a, you know, I don't care. I don't, this is Eddie Van Halen, right? I'm on the planet at the same time Eddie is, and I get to be here playing with him. That's all great with me. But for right. Billy, it was just a little bit like, it was just, it just wasn't right for him. And, he, and then he just kind of was like, yeah, and that kind of party. He, um, he just didn't want to, um, you know, right. really just... It was a combination of Eddie was Eddie was pretty you know erratic and uh, uh, you know you know what he was like back then you know and uh, I think it just was like not making Billy feel comfortable you know what I mean sure. but the musician side of Eddie I don't care like he's still Eddie Van Halen dude I don't care what happens this guy he's that's there's still this it's inside him and you can't deny it so uh, but he's as as much of a badass uh, genius he is, there's still that reckless side to Eddie. As we all, it's just a whole reckless side, you know. And maybe that side was coming out a bit more. Maybe that was it. But here's the deal: we're gonna play whatever it is. We're gonna, re but we're gonna rehearse in his backyard. So they're gonna have this whole lights and stage and rented drum set. I'm doing a Christmas record with Billy, and we're filming a Christmas video at some other house in Maholland that same day, like we're doing, like I'm in a suit and Billy's singing and we're filming these Christmas videos. And I'm like, but sound check starts at like four or five and I'm there with Billy. I'm like, I, I, I want to get over to Eddie's. This is like, I get to go to Eddie's. So as soon as they finish with me, like Billy had a little more to do, Brian, you're done. I change, get my car, go over there, right? I'm like, just couldn't get there quick enough, dude. This is, if there's one, dude, you can't, I can't believe I'm getting to do this. But I got to say before that day, Maybe the week before, I'm at home, Saturday afternoon, phone rings, dude. <laughs> this is the best stuff. Hello? Yes, yeah, Brian there. Yeah, this is him. Hey, it's Eddie Van Halen. <laughs> I go, now my friends don't play with Eddie, right? So I'm like, some one of my jackass friends is going to do the typical, yo, it's Eddie, man. Let's call Brian and tell him it's Eddie, right? So I go, yeah, right. Who is this? Just, it's Eddie Van Halen. I go, yeah, okay, okay. That's cool. Who is this? He goes, you play my fucking party, aren't you? And I go, I go, it's that sounds like Eddie. It sounds like Eddie. I go, yeah. He goes, yeah. Listen, it, yeah, it, yeah. I go, oh, how you doing, man? He goes, yeah. Is, is Billy there? Can I talk to Billy? I go, ah, we're not working today, you know. Um, but you know, I could get any message to him, you know. We're, we're just, and he goes, yeah. And he, all right, cool. Well, listen, I go, you know, this is Brian, the drummer, blah blah blah. I work, I work with Billy and all this stuff. Yeah, just tell him I wanted you jump in D, you know, just make sure. I go, and I'm like, so we're talking. You know, it was like basic, and he was cool. But I'm just like, oh, dude, Eddie Van Halen called my house. You know what I mean? It's called, it called my cell phone, right? And I'm like, so I go, dude, if there's anything you need to know, anything you want, just call me anytime. I'll make sure it all happens. You know, any other notes, any songs, any changes, anything. You know, all right, cool. I don't even know how he got my cell phone <laughs> so, that was pretty amazing man that was just amazing so i'm like and, and so i pull up to his house the week later it's friday john so it was eric dover john karabi because john would play these jams too um uh dizzy reap is on keys but because derek sherinian was such a huge eddie van and tight with he was friends with all of us but it's super tight with steph and the bass player Derek was like, dude, you gotta let me play with you guys. So, all right. So Dizzy was like, all right, Derek, you can come up and play like jump, whatever Derek played. Um, 
and you know, Dizzy played and Derek did a little bit. So anyhow, uh, that, that was the band, right? Eric Dover, John Karabi, Stefan Dika, myself, um, uh, Dizzy, and, and Derek Sherinian as our guest band member. Uh, <laughs> so I get there and they're all there. I put well, this is better though. I pull up, dude, I'm like, there's the gate. I ring it, they're gonna let me in, it opens. My window comes down. This is what I hear in the background. Right <laughs> behind his house, right? I'm going to you know, just like. <laughs> And I'm like, dude, Eddie's just cranking in his backyard, right? <laughs> I'm like, I'm just like shaking. Like, I get, I, this is insane. I'm going to go play drums with this, my idol. There's like, there's like John Bonham, Neil Peart, Eddie Van Halen, Jimmy Page, like Steven Tyler. That's like, bam, those are the guys for me. That's right. it. You know, those are the right. top. Yeah. It's come, you know, this is one of these guys that, and uh, so I pull up. I go in the back and they're playing and the fans are Karabi's on the drums. <laughs> get, off the drums get off the drums, man. And Eddie goes, who are you? And I go, I'm Brian. I'm the drummer. All right, cool. So I'm all mad that everybody's already jamming and hanging out. I wasn't there to experience this. I don't, they've been there for like an hour maybe. Right. But they can't do the proper like rehearsals. That's why John's playing drums. But John's supposed to be on rhythm guitar. Anyhow, we start playing and, and, I, and, and I, there's – Things are going on, like, for example, the sound man comes up and goes, Eddie, it's a little loud, man. Can you just come down? And Eddie goes, loud? I'll show you loud. <laughs> and he goes, bam, and it gets, like, way louder. He's like, that's loud. So we're, we, do, we do Panama. We do Jump. We do um, Rebel Yell. We do You, you Really Got Me. Um, a whole bunch of stuff. Um, and... Uh, but before Panama, he like oh, you come. So we played a couple songs, and and uh, you know I didn't get in. Like I didn't go back and revisit my uh, like Alex exact beat. I just played it, you know, in the ballpark or whatever. But he walks up for Panama, and he's like, he goes, you know the intro? I go, yeah. He goes, and a one. I go, yeah. He goes, all right, one, two, three, four, one, bang, the bang, because the song starts at the end of one. It's not, it doesn't sound like it does because it's just like rock and roll from Zeppelin. It sounds like it starts on one because there's no count in. But right. if that, if you want that 4 4 intro to come out to the one perfectly, the whole Panama intro just, there's a, a hidden eighth note before the song starts. Beat one. It starts on ants. It's one, two, three, four. Boom, bats, the 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 bats, you know, the, two times it does that. That's why it kind of comes in weird because we all hear it like dance to dance to dance, but it's not. It's so I get that right. Like, cool, man. You know, so so like good, little things like that. That's those are you're now going to gain the trust of your idol, <laughs> the legend whose backyard you're in, who you don't know, who's you are just like tripping out. We so it was all good, man. We had fun. Billy was there, but Billy was like, oh, we ain't talking about love. We did too, and Billy singing. And Billy's doing great, but he brought some lyrics, you know, and, and, and Eddie was just like, Bill, what's with the lyrics, man? We're just going to jam. Who cares? Yeah. And, and he's just, just doesn't care. He just wants to have fun, right? And Billy's like, well, I'll, I want to be prepared, man. I want to, like, do this right. You know, I don't want to screw it. You know, that's how Billy is, man. He's, you know, reliable like that, you know. Mm -hmm. But uh, we finished this rehearsal, and Derek, which we've talked about, <laughs> he, two things that Derek – and I don't remember. I think I remember, but we both like have different stories. Derek doesn't remember that he went to 5050 Studios before I was there. Because after we finished rehearsing, I don't know, Derek was doing all these Van Halen licks, like just totally. And, and Eddie's like, yo, you play my looks good, man. You know, like, because Derek <laughs> worships Eddie. So Derek was, we were all tripped out. We're getting to do this with, with, with Eddie Van Halen. So. Derek, maybe had enough confidence. We finish. He looks at Eddie and goes, Ed, you got to show Brian 5150. And Eddie's like, yeah, all right, let's go. Derek told me he was already up there. Like he already went and seen it. So for him to ask Eddie to go back up there, that's like pushing it. But because I wasn't there and maybe because we played, maybe because I gained some trust of Eddie's, you know, he's like, all right, cool. You know, 
I didn't say, dude, I'm the biggest fan. I'm like, we're all super fans. We all love you. You know, he <laughs> does it. So Eddie goes, all right, do it. So me, Derek, and Eddie went up to 5150. Dude, come on. This is now I'm in there's the shark, you know what I mean? There's the console, right? So we're talking. Wait, we walk in, he goes, yeah, this is that, this is that. He goes, shows me the drums. He gets on the drums and man, he, he, he started making some claims. Like he was talking a lot of stuff about, you know, whatever, like talking to me like we're good friends, you know, like he didn't care. Um, <clears throat> and it makes you feel sort of special. Like, wow, he's kind of like confiding into me and confiding in me in, in certain things. You got to look at it and go, yeah, it's just, it's Eddie Van Halen, man. The, the whole world wants to be that, you know, this is just, he's just being himself, you know. But he started claiming that he played, you know, drums on a Van Halen record because Alex was, you know, getting a divorce or something like that. And he goes, <laughs> but okay, whatever. But he goes, I, uh, because I showed Alex this lick I made up and I know the lick. He, was, he started trying to do this pattern which I've been listening to Alex do since the bootlegs, you know, since I was in high school. Like, it's a thing. It's a, it's a double bass. You hit the, the one on the uh, crash or the ride, and you put the trip in with your left hand. I did it good, it good. And I started doing it as a tribute to Alex because I heard, heard this in high school. So sometimes there's a flurry at the end of songs. I'll do the Alex just because it's me saying, you know, giving it up to Alex. But every time Eddie went to start this, he keep missing and hitting the rim. He kept hitting the rim, hitting the rim. And I saw what he was trying to go to do. And I, took, and I was like, God, I want to play those drums. I, I, I want to show him I know the lick he's doing. I want to do it. But I don't want to, like, kick him off his brother's drum set, you know, or, or imply. <laughs> so it was like, so I didn't. I didn't say anything. Was just like, and after, like, 15 tries, he finally was doing it, right? And uh, every time I went to hit, hit the snare, he'd hit the rim. It was like, I can't even remember what the drums sound like. This is me sitting in front of Alex's drums. I should be studying that snare drum I, I i didn't ask to play the drums i sh should have said hey man can i try a beat just to do it but right. i didn't and then he brought us back into the vault showed us all the all the uh Oops, yeah. two inch tape yeah okay so that, but then we go back in the control room, and this is what derek and i don't he starts talking about how he was a tough kid and people would want him to he would sometimes have to get into fights and maybe because he you know, didn't speak the language, maybe there was stuff like he was, was a little kid going on, you know, somebody mocking him out because he has an accent, whatever it was, but he, cause man, I used to get into fights. I could have sworn he came in front of me over to Derek. It was like, so this kid comes up to me and I went, yeah, yeah. And he punched Derek in the stomach. Derek says, he punched you. I go, did he even punch me? I would have remembered. I looked Derek. <laughs> Neither of us can remember which one got punched in the stomach by Eddie, but I know it was him. I watched it. I was like, dude, he just punched Derek. It wasn't like really, really hard, but it was solid. Yeah. And he's like, but he's telling a story about how he had to fight as a kid. Oh, yeah. He wasn't mad at any of us. He was just hanging, telling a story. And we're just like, dude, there's the shark. <laughs> like, the star is probably there. This is where they record. And here you are telling us about fighting as a kid, and you're punching Derek in the stomach. And I'm just like, Dude, I, I, I can't. There's too much, too much happening at once, right? So we end up, you know. So we, and then he talks about, you know, he brings up his divorce. He, he talks a little crap about Dave and Sammy, you know, about you know making money to pay things off. Ah, just do a tour this summer, bad pay, you know, whatever. <laughs> so uh, it was just a whirlwind. Um, but I'll tell you one thing, man. Uh, his this I didn't mention when we started playing. And I played with a lot of amazing guitar players, like for real. Like these, some of these guys, have, you know, the Zach Wiles and the Slash, the Steve Stevens, Doug Aldridge, Mick Jones, Don Feld. Like, there's a load of guitar players. George Lynch, right? Bad right. Shanker, dude. When Eddie, when Eddie started playing, just the the groove and the rhythm, I. I played into his groove. Like I, it was so massive. I don't it, like. It's, it's cool when things groove and you're playing with somebody and you can feel it. It's big, you know. Especially when you're on stage, it's loud or whatever. But but the something about it was just like, man, I've been playing to you for all these years. I grew up. I like. There's a part of me that grooves in a certain way because the amount of hours I played to Van Halen. But I. It, it was like this big, awesome square of groove that I just inserted myself into and worked with. And as long as I stayed with that, 
I was all good. It wasn't me playing and Eddie locking up to me as the drummer, which, you know, the drummer should lead the show. I've just, it was like this big ball of energy and groove that just took over. It's like, whoa. Now, I know part of it is like, dude, I'm starstruck. You're Eddie Van Halen. So you could do no wrong, right? Right, right. Um, but <laughs> I, the guy plays the way he plays. I don't care if he's, if he, I don't care if his motor skills weren't there as much. I, I mean, he gave us, in that lifetime, so much to, to so much in so many ways. Like, right. okay, so this isn't the one year where he's kicking ass, doing his freaking hummingbird picking as whatever, man, it's Eddie Van Halen. You know, this is a, this is a period. We all have periods in our life. There's ups, there's downs. There's, you know, oh, I, I've had a good year. Oh, I, I mean, I'm, this is a cool gig or this sucks or this is depressing or this everybody goes through stuff right so why, why why is he why should he not be allowed to like come on man okay so if there's drugs and alcohol involved blah 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 right but you, you, do you know what it's like to become eddie van halen do you know what it's like to have a solo called eruption to take over the world and then be gotten all, be given all this attention at 23 and basically wherever you go everybody's falling at their knees because you're freaking eddie van halen like do you know what it's like because that's not normal you know what I mean? It's not normal. You have to learn to live with this thing where you don't want to deal with people like that. You don't want to, but you have to. You know, do you know what it's like to have like it, it just all that success and money and fame and all the, the, the women and the lifestyle in the 80s? Like, dude, it's not normal. You can't tell me how you're saying you might you wouldn't be a drug addict, alcoholic after a few years of that. How do you know? You're not going to know. You know what I mean? I don't even care if you're a rock star. You're not Eddie Van Halen. Right, you know right. what I'm saying? Like, so, so whatever, man. He went. He's going through stuff, man. So try and handle that lifestyle. And somebody, he keeps putting out, keeps somebody, putting out killer music. Somebody told me that he said one time that um, <laughs> he liked to separate himself from the character of his his rock star character, and he would say, "I become Eddie Van Halen." when I've got to be like tough or what he, he like, I'm Edward and then I'm Eddie Van Halen. And he would like literally have this th thing that happened where he would separate himself. Yeah. From, but from but I, I think, I think he played the game amazingly well in every way. We're all the fans. We're all this huge, huge super fans. He was a, he was a God, but he also came across like an aw shucks. I just like oh, yeah. play guitar, yeah, totally. you know, but the techniques, then you, you, there's the songwriting, there's, there's songwriting, there's riffs that are parts of songwriting, and then there's his techniques, not just his like groundbreaking inventive tech, like there's this, the patterns that Eddie used to create this stuff. It, it's, there's so much going on, but anyways, it was amazing, and we went back the next day, <clears throat> and, um, and he was really cool. Uh, he, was, he was really nice. Um, he just, you know, he's changing strings. Some people have told me stuff, Remember we were watching him do that? And I'm like, no, I don't remember that because it was just too much, man. I'm still, I, see, I don't know how long it's going to take before I can be comfortable around Eddie Van Halen. It took me a while to be comfortable around like, uh, you know, uh, uh, David Coverdale or Billy Elliot or an Ozzy. Like, you know, you don't just walk. Like, I don't. I can't just walk in. You hired me. I'm hired to be like, I, I, I need your approval. I need you to be happy with me before I think I can hang out on any kind of level that's like normal. You know what I mean? And even if we are friends and getting along because I'm doing a decent job and I'm not a total dickhead. I have no clue what it's like to be existing on this planet. We have the dreams, you know, and I might have, to, I have to had, had some success as far as like having dreams and to like being able to play drums for a living and play with bands that I grew up on. That's all cool. But man, I have no clue. What it's like to freaking be the guy that played guitar in Van Halen one that invented tapping. I don't care what you say about anybody else. Nobody did that. Okay. Nobody made a musical piece out of it. <laughs> Come on. Sure. You know what I mean? Sure. Like, you know, and all the way to still to this day, since the intro of mean street has come out, there is nothing that sounds that other worldly since then that that is still like, what is this? What, people thought eruption was a synth, you know, like me, mean street, since I mean, who was coming up with that? And, and it's not the hardest thing in the world. Like it's not, I'm not saying it's easy because it's not, because if I can't do the whole thing right now, I got the basics, but to make that sound, you need Eddie's tone. You need his groove, that rhythm, the rhythm alone, 
That's already a funk, funky rhythm, man. That's not a normal, like, heavy metal dudes. Wow, this is. That's Latin. You know what I mean? There's, where did he get? And he's doing it with distortion and muted, and it's percussive. And it's. What? That's not a guitar. Where, where, yeah, it's, that's a button you press on the synthesizer. You know what I mean? Right. Um, it's, it's amazing. So, so, uh, but anyways, we, we played the show, and, and the, 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 some of the highlights were like, uh, well, the highlight was playing with him. And, um, uh, and him, you know, at least one summer in the rehearsal or, or during the show or whatever, he complimented me. He said, you know, he, you know, addressed me being a decent drummer, took pictures inside his house. Uh, he was, uh, I think he was showing people, he was talking all about Wolfgang, like how badass Wolf was and how insanely talented, which, you know, we've all come to see, you know, that's that, that you know, he, he is and he's put the time in and he comes from his dad and it's, you know, there you go, man. Uh, but he was raving about him and uh, uh, he was, I think he was playing piano at one point. He was changing his own strings. Uh, but this whole thing is, man, he's just, like he's, he says he's a self-proclaimed tone chaser. He's that, that's it, man. There's I can't see any other. That's where it seems like he's his best is when he's got a guitar on and he's got a tone around him that's making him happy. Then it's you know. So it was just it was just a, a complete. I defaulted into being there. I just happened to be the drummer at the show. The only good thing is what when he got word, oh, the band consists of guys that play with bands like they're pros. That's what sold him. So it was, oh, it's a guy from drummer from Billy Idol, guys from Guns N' Roses, guys that were in, you know, Alice Cooper, whatever. That was the sell, but but that was just great to um, be able to to be a part of that, just to have that memory. There's, you know what I mean? Now, yeah. especially that he's not here, that was, uh, you know, I, I like I said, I don't care. You know, nobody wants him to abuse himself to the point where he, his health is completely um, affected. But uh, you know, it's. He was just going through that part of his life, you know what I mean? Where, where you know, he was, uh, he wasn't maybe all there in the way we we we've seen him in, in other years. Which right, when right. he came back in the final final tours, he was playing his ass off. Sure, sure. But man, like I said, what a life! What a life! You can't. It's he's living ten to twenty lives at once. Like that many, that much information is going. He's giving out. To the world, making the world happy, and it's it, and and people want to get to him, dude. That's not normal. That's yeah, not it's, normal. So, How it's, so weird, it's so weird though. You know that a, a lot of people on that have been on, you know, started like you and me. They um, were in bands, and they ended up in California, and then by some random chance, they they get the phone call from Eddie Van Halen, and he's yeah. calling them, and 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 it's such a an amazing full circle moment for people like you and, and a lot of the other guys that have been on uh, it, it, not just in as musicians, as produ producers, other people that have gone through a similar uh, circle in their life where they, they they're inspired by the guy as a kid. And then they end up in his presence. So, lots of times alone, you know, just, yeah, it's, 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 he it's heavy. There's no other way. There's, there's, I don't want to, I, I, I want it to be what it was, meaning I, I want it to trip me out. I don't, you know, I, it's, it, it, it's just, I, I don't know much to say about it other than it's just, yeah, man, if you've ever felt like that, that's a great feeling to have just to be, not just to meet somebody. Me, I don't really want to meet somebody like that. I, you know, just, Hey, this is Brian. Hi. How, I want to, if I can meet you on a musical level and I can show you that I've put time into, like we're on a similar page in the book of life meaning we're musicians i didn't break ground on drums i didn't write van halen one or all the 30 years of van halen uh, you know i'm not that but at least i'm i'm i mean i'm a musician i you know i to, if i, I get a little bit of respect for that from yeah. the, somebody that i wor worship like that that's amazing that's worth you know that get i've said it before that's the shit that gets you through hard times that's like man you know what if i got to this place and i wasn't kicked out the uh, off the property because I suck, you know, and he actually complimented me. You know how that'll get me through a lot of times where that's not happening, or you know what I mean? Like we all have ups and downs, you know. That's when you, you put that in your backpack and you're like, okay, man, I got a some, I got a bunch of those to get me through some hard times. You know, whatever the hard time is, you you can define it as uh, as as you want on your own, whatever it is to you. But you know, you use that. You go, man, 
I look at it like even if I got here and I did this and it was okay, and it was inspirational, for A, and it was also, it went well, you know, like, that's, why can't I get to this? And if I get there, why can't I get to this? If I get there, why can't I go there? Why can't I go as far as I want to? I, I don't know. I don't know what it takes. I don't, nobody has the answers, you know. Eddie Van Halen wasn't like, dude, I've got the running with the devil riff, the ain't talk about love riff, and the on fire riff. It's going to take over the world. It's just a matter of time. Like, he, you, you have confidence. you you got to believe in your riffs. Like you write some good shit. But he didn't know until it happened. But when it happened, it, it was happening quickly. I mean, yeah, people in the backyard parties or, or Gazaris and all that, you know, they're all like, watch Van Halen kick ass. But mm -hmm. that's not the same as, like, the record out, the single out. You know, just like, like they had you really got me and, um, uh, what was it, Angel? The band Angel, the manager heard it and said, dude, you guys get in the studio. Put, you record, you really got me. You got to get a, a Van Halen fan out. So screw that. They put it out quick. Warner Brothers put it out quicker or whatever. Right, because right. that's how badass it was. Because it was right. that, like, yeah. But yeah. A couple, a couple little things just to, right. that I remembered. When Eddie, on the drums, the mics were around. I just wish I had, I wish I took advantage of this a little more. But I didn't know I'd even be able to get in a 5150, you know? But he's like, yeah. It's like, yeah, record the drums. No compression. No EQ. It's all straight in the board drive, which that's it. Okay, cool. It's because I was like, wow. Like, okay. Because uh, whatever. But then, then he goes, microphone. And he's put the Tom mic. Like, Tom, the Tom's like here. And instead of the mic being, you know, there, getting that, you know, without having a, you know, the farther away, the more bleed, right? But he had it up here. And he's like, he goes, yeah. He goes, uh, you got to keep the mics further away. Like, pick up the full sound. He goes, you look at a painting on the wall. Do you walk up to the front of the painting like this? You look right in the no you take a step back you look at the whole thing and that's how he was equating you know mm -hmm. uh that you know two sides of things you know the, the art of recording how you get you know a, a truer picture of sound mm -hmm. uh just like you would not look at a painting right over two inches in front of it the painting's like 10 feet long or whatever but i i was those those little things were so just they were just so cool you know because this is his world and this is what, how he's thinking and you know, if you're into anything having to do with recording or engineering or studio stuff, it's like, dude, you know, those Van Halen records sound amazing. And um, it's not, you know, it's, it's, it's Templeman, it's Landy, it's like, it's the combination of the players, how great they played together. You know, it's, it's all of it. But there's a huge part of it is, is Eddie's ears, you know what I mean? And especially... I love that he made 50 and 50 for demos and they made 1984 there. I love it. I love the sound of that record. It's awesome. And, and 50 and 50. So was he, you know, and there, there's, you know, Damon has met him and hung out with him. And uh, when he came back from tour 95, when they did a stint with Van Halen, I asked him about it and he, and he just was like, you know, and I, I said this about the Z and times on here, but he just said they were like regular guys, you know, he's a regular guy like you and me, but did he come, did you feel that way? I mean, you know, this is you, you know, obviously you're me like me, a huge fan, but did you kind of feel like, wow, he is really just kind of like normal. <laughs> yeah. He just had, yeah. But he, like I said, I'm meeting him in 2000. What did what, what I say? What, six, 2006? 2006, yeah. Meeting him in 2006. That's a long way down his life to become what I'm hanging around with. You know, um, like I said, the, like, that's a, a, an amazing life he's led, an amazing body of work. And, and he's made his mark in such a huge way. Um, but he it's just all – he's got the whole picture, the whole picture top to bottom, the image. I mean, he looked like a rock star, right? The whole thing. It, um, he had fun on stage. He wrote so much crazy. Like the whole, the, the tone, the unique guitar, all the inventions. I want to go with, yeah, the, the, the fine tuners on the, um, like how annoying with no fine tuners to sit there and mess with a Floyd Rose like he was talking about. He's like, yeah, to, to Floyd, put, you got to put some cello, fine tuners like a cello. Because he says he had a cello line around, which we've seen pictures of him with the cello. I remember seeing that on the cover of Guitar World back in the when he had hair, short hair. Yeah, right. There's a cello, you know, it was like the 80s sometime. So I have a cello. It sounds like, dude, are you really that hardcore 80 fan? You bought a cello. No, I love the sound of a cello. I suck at it. Um, 
but uh, I barely put any time in. But I, was I like, got oh, a cello, cello too. Cello. I've got a cello in there, and our, and it's got fine tuners. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah. But but and and I th- th- didn't realize this. So, like I don't don't know the history of fine tuners. Right. But but uh, um, I just always some some things. I'm like, if I have it around, I'll I'll pick it up. Like if it's there, I'll right. pick it up. That's why I want. I have I have guitars like all over the place because it's. There's go-to places where I sit in my house, but it's got to be – like if I have an acoustic right next to me, that I'm going to pick it up and continue working on it. I'm going to leave you finger-picking like it, because it's there. I'm, it's going to – you know. but if it's over there and I'm always here, I might not – you know, it might be way less time dedicated. But anyways, uh, he's – the amount he, he invented and came up with, the amount of heavy rocking, the amount of hooks and melody and singles, the amount of – interesting shit like big bad bill meets sunday afternoon in the park meets intruder like dude that's only eddie that's just would you one foot out the door is crazy you know what i mean um but also his stage presence his and then his his image on stage that's his that is the that's a rock star that's just the guitar the guitars the stripes Mm -hmm. i know that the the the, way they call the dills all right you know Right. Yeah. What? Okay. That's cool. And let's say it was an inspiration. Maybe so. Maybe stripes look cool. Maybe Eddie went. Maybe. But Eddie made it. I don't know the Dills music. I don't even know who they are. I just know this because of Eddie Stripes. That's the only reason I know that band. So he took stuff and it all went to the top in a big way. Uh, you know. Right. Right. He's, he's, you know, I mean, the whole. Th- it's crazy. Yeah, man. It's crazy. Let me ask so, you. So, but wait, but oh, to yeah. answer your question, sorry. Oh, yeah. He was a regular guy. Yeah, I. Yeah, I. But I can't tell you what. You know, after all that, that life. Yeah, he seemed like a regular guy. He seemed like a guy <laughs> who just loved to play play guitar and and be a musician. And uh, and, pl- and I shouldn't, you know, forget about mentioning playing piano because I think that's a that's so much of where this the. The, the coming up with tapping and then writing an eruption melody, you know, that, that, because it is like a song within a song, mm-hmm. um, at peace. It's like, I, to me, it's his ears from all those years of working on Classical. piano. And in that video, you know, that video Wolf, Wolfgang came out with for his first single last year for his record or a couple of years ago. Mm-hmm. It was a hit. It was a lot of private home videos of him and his dad for the most part. That was the video. Yep. Yep. And a lot of clips in there. I've only seen it like once or twice when it came out. Um, but there was like a lot of clips of Eddie sitting around the piano. And if you look at his fingers and his hands and what he's doing on the piano, it, he looks very limber and adept at just playing, like already getting around a piano. Strong. It looks strong. Mm-hmm. You can't tell me when you're a kid, and that's another thing that a lot of people don't think about. When you're a kid practicing and you're growing up, you're getting taller, you're like 10 years old, then you're 12, 14, 16. All those years of your body growing up and you're playing an instrument, your body's just so used to motions and the way you are. You can't tell me growing up playing piano, that didn't strengthen his fingers. So when he got to guitar and he's doing both, that just, it all worked to his advantage. I mean, I've even read, you know, Michelangelo Badio said, you know, with the two necks, he's like, because he's playing piano, it just seemed to make sense, right? Mm-hmm. But, you know, so yeah, I would say there's a total strength in you know taking that all those years of piano which you know it, maybe he was more him and alex were more like forced to play the parents musicians you know that that's what you can do because my mom made me take piano lessons second and third grade i hated it i couldn't stand it but that little bit of knowledge and that little bit of practice sure. like, i i can't maybe play piano i different. understand it but, but it makes a difference know, but it was yeah, it's he just like, pushed. He went to the next level you know I mean, you think about you know his his hands weren't extremely big even though phil said that in the last interview that there weren't i mean if you go to the rock walk in hollywood and you measure his hands with your hands you'll realize they're not i mean i'm pretty average size hands no bigger than mine but his dexterity now that's a whole different and his ability to stretch oh, that's what i'm saying you know that's what i'm saying when yeah. you're working on octaves and licks on a piano and getting because if i sit down and mess around with a piano for a few minutes all these little muscles that i don't use anywhere else on this planet start becoming affected. Mm-hmm. So if you're sitting there, you're Billy Joel, you're Elton John all night long playing piano, bap, 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 singing and playing. All these muscles that the average person, the non-piano player, are gonna be really strong. So now you're a kid, your bones are growing, you're getting taller and you're stronger. And you're, now all those years of that stuff on piano, 
bam, right on the guitar. That becomes the freaking, that Thanks. becomes the, yeah, yeah, the, big the ice cream man. That's the ice cream man spread right there. And it's for those of you, watch <laughs> Eddie at the US Festival when he brings that guitar right here to get that stretch. He ain't using the ring finger. He's using the middle finger for that four fret. So it starts at the middle and the whole lick goes, I can't do it. Maybe I can do it a little bit if I was here, but by the time you get to that last note, yeah. dude, that's not easy. But that, that, pattern, that's, uh, I, that pattern I think is that's, brutal. That pattern is brutal. Uh, yeah. Probably on better, but anyway, on better. I know the pattern, but it's I'm not smooth with it yet, especially yeah. the string. That, yeah, when you sw switch strings, right? Yeah, I'm a, I'm sl I'm a sloppy mess with it right now. I know what it is, but um, it, yeah. what, what, I, what I do know is from working on that and the licks and push comes to shove, those bully, 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 you know, that yeah. stuff, when you yeah. start really working on that stuff, I'm like, wow. I'm a, so piano, Eddie Van Halen, kid, starts working on stuff like this, hears things in his head, classical type stuff, spreads Alan Holdsworth, that huge I gonna, influence. I was going to say to you, though, you know, well, you just said ice cream man stretch. Okay, so when did when did he even know about Holdsworth? Because people will always attribute that lick to Holdsworth, but this is pre Holdsworth, right? Now that's that's a really good question, but it's that's the same stretch as the uh, as uh, um, it, okay. It's the same. Uh, you know, I, I so I'm assuming for eruption, he's got you know the. the, the First, the the middle finger up four frets to go. So so that's the most natural way to play without having to move anything around. Because a lot of people, as, as a kid, I used to grow up. You know, I would go boom, 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 and I'd be sliding my first finger all over, right? Because the slide comes after when you go down. But he doesn't. I think he's. Oh shit! No, I'm playing it wrong. Now I got to play it right. Okay, here we go. I think that maybe the first. Oh, so, anyways, all oh, right, yeah. Um, but but I'm saying what, that's '78. And he's doing that, obviously. Well, that's also that's also a melody very close to a classical theme piece. Right, right. A classical right. piece. I don't know what it is, but it's something that he probably had on piano. Sure, sure. Yeah, of course. So I so so I'm going with the Holdsworth became the drop dead legs outro it became the push comes to shove, uh, it became the, the, some of the, the center swing some of the hear about it later like there's little bits and pieces, um, it's, uh, uh, some of the girl gone bad maybe solo parts there's there's, uh, but I think maybe those stretches, it's come from piano, yeah. I think I, I, from from you're constantly doing like root third fifth stuff octaves on piano sure. and if he's learning anything having to do with classical and having a banda don't banda don't banda don't banda like any of that and that probably translates onto the guitar and becomes like the eruption classical movement that's good so Harmony. that's probably and then he hears holdsworth who's the stretch stretch king and he's like well i've already got some things in that world but i just don't take it as out as alan you know what i mean Right, right, right. Yeah, that's what I kept thinking. Like, thinking when, 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 you know, when did Hol he was hanging with Holdsworth in the early eighties? Yeah. Uh, so you know, this had been years, not too far removed from their first record, but but I can't remember when their relationship and his his uh, knowing about Alan Holdsworth happened. I'll probably know. Then, probably know soon though. Then, what about this thing? This uh, um, let me. I I haven't pressed this enough. Oh yeah, that one. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I didn't know that, and I really haven't put much time into it. But it's a good exercise, and then he moves it up. Mm -hmm. Like that's in Spanish fly, right? Mm -hmm. Seventy nine. Yeah. I and it's also in the intro of fools. Yeah. So, Sherinian pointed that one out to me. I was like, I never really listened to it. I was like, no, it's just that I thought it. No, it's just, I was like, it's just, I wasn't really listening. And then he said, no, I go, oh man. I go, you think Eddie would sit around and make up bada, 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 bada. And he goes, yeah, I think it's, but he did. He's, he uses it and it's a very unique lick. And it's, 
And those uh, those spreads in Spanish Fly aren't easy. It's I can't I can't nail oh, that. that one right there. Yeah, yeah, that one. They're down to A and A. That's dude. <laughs> so he so I'm saying as a kid, you're working on all the piano. That's stretching out those fingers, and then put that stuff on guitar. And here's in his head, and that's in that, that that's in and um I didn't realize the whole symmetrical scale stuff until the past few months when I've been like digging more into Eddie, but like. I remember hearing, I did hear somebody, over the years, somebody show you a lick here and there. And I remember somebody going to the ice cream, ice cream man. Oh, they showed me wrong. They showed me a different, it was like close. It was the same spread, but it didn't involve one of the notes. And it was more, and it was a different pattern. And that's how I always played ice cream. I was like, oh, that's what it is. And they go, you just go right down the neck. And I go, but if I go down the neck, I'm like hitting notes that aren't in the scale. Like I'm totally out of the key. Like I'm not major, not minor. I'm hitting a sharp four, a, a flat nine, a blah, blah, whatever. And, and uh, it's like, yeah, but that's, that's, that's part of Eddie's personality inside everything else he does, which can be blues based, can be sort of classical based. And then he can have these out things that are just like getting you from like A to B. But um, like, like, you know, like the, I'm the one really when he goes, you know, that shit, that's like, it's all like the same frets, just right up the neck. It's Two like times it, he does that in the song. It's like the jump. Three times, it's actually. like the end of jump, right? That's the same basic lick. It's the end of jump, the, the run. Yeah. 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 And, 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 uh, um, it's like, uh, what, where did he, you know, what, wh where did he come up with that? Because he has to know on piano, like some sort. He has to know theory on piano because you're okay. This is C major. This is C minor. You know that. You know an F. You, you know you're working on piano for like six years nonstop, right? And a lot of people, um, a lot like, of people, really, you know, they talk about. Well, you hear the discussions like people say, "Well, he didn't read or write music," but I, but yeah, but he took massive classical, and his ear became so trained that you know when he gets the guitar, it's like it's just you know what's in his ear, and then getting around yeah, so you have to know a major to a minor like he's got to know those basics and and you can apply all that piano training to the guitar it's, you can transfer a lot of it and then you're taking all those clapton blue all the clapton that he worked on with that feel and that you know that slow hand think about he's learning slow hand but he's going to be the original shredster he's the original shred speed king like i mean he starts a world that Everybody follows every the, Randy Rhodes and Ingve and Vi Satch, Dime, all like it starts at Van Halen one. You know what I mean? Of course, there's other stuff. Of course, but I'm saying what everybody became known for is all based off of what Eddie did sure. on Van Halen one. Well, like, let me what, ask what everybody was going for. Let me ask you this: since you played with George Lynch and Eddie Van Halen on stage. You know, Lynch is a, a, a very, uh, you know, when I was, when I discovered Eddie, I was like, man, there's got to be some other guys like this guy, you know, like somebody else that sounds kind of like this guy or something. And then I saw the Breaking the Chains video and I heard that Marshall on that first album of Dawkins and, and I was immediately attracted to him. And then, you know, I followed him forever and um, he does a lot of outside, you know, you know, artificial harmonics. He did some things he, that Eddie did. Uh, you would hear some of those artificial harmonics, like in the solo, and hear about it later. You know, the the, the squeals and all the stuff. Yeah. And then Lynch kind of went crazy with that, and it became like Zach Wild and all these people. It proliferated. But when you have been on stage with Lynch, or or even talked to Lynch about Van Halen, you know what? Um, what's your impression of that? Those guys in that era and and Lynch. I mean, Lynch came up like parallel to him in the same clubs. They were in the same world. I, I well, dude, Eddie said Lynch was the guy back then. And I he told did. that I'm like George, George, you, George, you know, like I've read it that Eddie said you were the cat, and George acknowledges. He goes, yeah, that, you know, I, I'm aware. He said that. I go, dude. Eddie Van Halen said, you were the man back then. Like, <laughs> he said dude, that. And I've, awesome. never, I've never heard that. But you, or, or, you know yeah. where that came from? Do you know what? Yeah. Where? Oh, no. I don't know where. But it's been at least twice over the past, like, 20 years I've read somewhere that Eddie said, yeah, you know, because everybody wants to go, Eddie, but, you know, you and Randy Rhodes, you and Randy Rhodes, right? And then, But it was like George was, was out there then, too. 
and George was on fire. And, uh, it, and Eddie acknowledged it. Uh, Eddie said, uh, I think it didn't. What, whatever, what was, what were they called? Uh, the boys, the boys, didn't the, yeah, boys, the boys open for Van Halen? Yeah. Yeah. They, well, they, the boys were supposed to, uh, well, I think, wasn't it Van Halen? I don't know if Van Halen opened for the boys, but yeah, the boys opened for Van Halen and Gene Simmons was supposed to come check out the boys. And check out the boys. So, so yeah, they're, you know, but, 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 uh, George was aware of that. George also took over teaching for Randy when Randy went to Ozzy. This is like a, there's a lot of shit going on then, like a lot of awesome stuff. Um, George, I grew up on George. I mean, there, there was another one in high school. I was uh, tr trying to learn the whole damn tooth and nail record. Sure. You know, and, I, and that was a little, you know, I was, I had already put my time into struggling through some Van Halen and Rhodes, you know, so, but I had learned some things and then, uh, um, yeah, so I was trying to learn all that stuff, and, and uh, one thing I didn't pay attention to back then was vibrato, and my and, and I just didn't. Nobody told me about it. It sucked. I'm so aware of it now. I uh, wish I, I, I love if everybody from Angus's vibrato to Slashes to 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 Zach to Luca Third to Eddie to Ingve Shanker. Like there's you know vibrato's huge, you know, like and uh, it's there's so much, you know. But, 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 but George, George, yeah, but, but George, that's what I was getting at. Is, is George has great vibrato, and I, um, uh, but he didn't really. See, he loves loves Eddie. I mean, he's just he'll, he gives it up for every like all the same people we do. He's like, yeah, he's just amazing. And but George has also made himself a name as a guitar hero for playing how he plays. So whatever he's heard in his head and whatever he's worked on, for, for, from whatever influences, when like. I love listening to him play like straight up blues, dude. If you like, just like, there was some stuff we were working on. I remember in the studio, and I, he was just, it was, he was just doing straight pentatonic, and it sounded so good. Like none of the other little odds and ends that he puts that's a part of his playing. And I was like, dude, that's awesome. Just, just, just knock it. Just do a, just do straight blues solo for this. It's so. He's like, yeah, but it's like, but he was like, yeah, but. That's stock stuff everybody does. I'm like, yeah, but you sound so good. It's like when Ingve busts into blues stuff, like hardcore pentatonic. Dude, he sounds awesome when he does that. Sure. You know, sure when, when Eddie, yeah. when Ingve gets off of the harmonic minor and sweeping and all that stuff, he's never, dude, first of all, his tone is amazing. His vibrato is amazing. So when he hits into that bluesy, it's just, he smokes it. He's, and, and George, I know. People, dude, people George always too. Always give him shit, you know, because of all that. But you listen to something like that song, Save Our Love, where he does that just killer solo on that, where it's all melodic. And he kind of combines all his great techniques along with his awesome vibrato. And, you know, he just... Vibrato, that's the... For me, that's the top. Holdsworth vibrato. But, like, like Ingve for me, is the top because it's a combination of that tone with that vibrato. It just sings... It just comes out... Um, you can't, like... Zach for being Zach, his vibrato was just so massive and undeniable. And he's been playing like that since the first time I heard him play, which was a cassette tape of him and my his bass player in his band, JD, jamming back on a Christmas when he just got the Aussie gig. And he came back to Berkeley and he's like, my buddy Zach got the Aussie gig. I'm like, what? He's like, yeah, we're jamming this Christmas. And I was like, dude, he, he was just, that's just a huge command to come in and out of stuff and pow and nail that vibrato. Um, but Eddie... Eddie's vibrato is, God, there's so many little bits, of, there's so many parts where he throws it in there so quickly, not fast vibrato, but it's just a smidge to end a phrase. And mm -hmm. if he didn't end a phrase with that vibrato, it wouldn't have had that impact. It's like, and it's gotta be aware that he's got, he's got some strong ass hands. And <clears throat> then I'm, I'm realizing, because I used to use thicker strings, because I was used to play Zach, and so I was like, all right, I have bigger strings, and I used to detune a bunch. So I'd have like 60 on the bottom, because I'd always have a D, but then I'm like, how is this? Why do I want to struggle that much? Like Steve Ray Vaughan, I think he uses, you know, Zach, I don't know what Zach uses now. It might be like 10 to 52 or whatever, but, but, uh, I just started going, what's Eddie use? What's Paige use? He's, all these other guys that are, are like awesome. It's, you, you know, Billy you don't have, like, Billy uh, Gibbons on seven. Gibbons. Yeah, it, it's, Slash was using maybe 11s at one point. And it's like, he's got really strong hands, but like, I don't know, man. There's, Every to, to, to each their own, you know. You do what you do, but um, I started going. Eddie was like nine to forty-two or forty, and uh, down, yeah. down a half. Yeah, down, down a half. But 
but he's got some killer vibrato. And uh, but you know what? You, you you mentioned you know how he would sneak it in there where you get you know that that extra thing from him. So like for for example, one thing I think of is when he hits that big massive overbend on Mean Streets, the first note solo he goes way up. Oh yeah 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 yeah. And then yeah, he yeah, kind of yeah. he kind of falls. And then he does this little vibrato and then he drops into the, you know, into the root and it, it's. Oh no. Yeah. It's that's so quirky and so Eddie. And it's so like, I know that solo like note by note, you know? So if you change the, if somebody went to play that for me, dude, I nailed it. Like, I'd be like, yeah, but like he's got the, sw he's got the swing in there. He's got the groove. He's got the feel. It's got the, it's this random sense of rhythm, but it's so in control even when it's out of control. And and oh, we were talking about George. I did. That's that's what I want to say. Is like I, I I remember my 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 uh, left hand pinky just sucks. <coughs> I never put enough time into it, and I've been trying to recently. It sucks. I'm like, dude, how long have you been playing guitar and you didn't put time in your pinky? But I remember George had a really nice stretch and strong pinky, and he had nice vibrato with his pinky. He has got he's got killer vibrato. That's another oh, thing yeah. that's infectious yeah. about George. I'd be hanging around him, playing mm -hmm. how I play, and as soon as I'd be listening to him. Every all my my vibrato gets better. It just gets a little more <laughs> slinky, and I and because he's got great vibrato. I tell but you. He also, that. he's got this. He's got that whole the Randy and him and and Warren. You know, it's it's like yeah. I can't, dude. I, I already feel like tension in here. Like I don't, you know, I don't play that way. But uh, but it's really in control with the pinch harmonics. Like really. He's got a man. You just I can hear George in that one note when he'll play a little lick and he'll come out and he'll do forget the vibrato the the, the back sideways vibrato but he'll just hit a, a pinch harmonic in a certain way, and I'm like I've known about pinch harmonics. Zach Zach's also you know like it's amazing at it. Dimes amazing. Dimes super Eddie Eddie Dime so in control with pinch harmonics like you can like and I remember learning as a kid and I go wow there's so many places to do so many but you can't I can't always just nail it. But I would just go, yeah. But I got it. Like I can dig in, and I know, like if the you know, the more uh, output, what do you call it? More gained up pickups. The more you can nail pinch harmonics. I played somebody else's guitars with more like whatever they super lead or super marzi or whatever. Like that's like fully metal metalified pickups, and bam, when you hit them, they just jump out even more. Sure. I don't really have maybe my Dean. I don't even think my Dean has a pickup like that. But uh, but anyways. Uh, it it really is a nice art because these guys make it look so simple, you know, when they knock out these pinch harmonics. But man, but George, killer vibrato, um, he's a tone chaser too. He's always going for. You, you know, know what, man? Look, like, a couple weeks ago, he was here. He was uh, here two weeks ago, and he played with a local band with the guy with the uh, X Y Z Terry Lewis. Oh yeah. Okay, so they were playing, and I happened to end up right in front of his rig, like, I mean, like five feet in front of his cabinets. They had him covered yeah. with uh, packing blankets, but it sounded phenomenal. And, um, you know, the thing about George, he's like great, a great singer, like Steve Perry or somebody. Second he plays a phrase, man, you go, <laughs> that's why he's George Lynch. He just has yeah, a he, he, it's. He's, it's, he's got strong hands, strong vibrato, strong command of like his pinch harmonics, which brings out a lot of character and makes you sound like you because it's consistent. Like it's just a part of his personality. It's like, you know, it's like somebody with a Southern accent, you know, it's just like that, that drawl is in there. Sure. And, uh, you know, if I'm, and, and if you're in my house and the guy from New York's in my house, and the guy from Boston's in my house and I don't see you speaking, but I hear you across, I'm going to hear that Southern drawl go. You know what I mean? That's that's Jeff, and or that's Bill, or that's Tom. Right. You know, sure. Um, yeah, it's a sound, which is it's amazing. It's like we all have those little things, and but to me, <laughs> yeah, the str strong vibrato. Like, come on, there's there's like I don't even need to get into the players that don't have great vibrato, but it's like it just always sounds a little juvenile, and it just doesn't sound as bad as Steve Lukather. Man, come on, pow! He right. throws down, dude. That's like that's that's a force. Neil Shaw, you know, all these guys. Neil Sean. Sean. Oh yeah, man. That's, I mean, that's, he's, he's killing it. It's just such a beautiful, I, mean, yeah, I love, I, I love the, um, I mean, there's so much great Sean stuff, but I, I always like, I stop and get stopped in my tracks. Whenever you hear the outro of, um, stone in love, I'm just like, Oh yeah, dude, that is, that's actually I really mean, hard to play that, you know, like to play it, to play it like him. It's like, you know, 
to have that. that so I'm going to try and learn that someday that's soon. Pretty cool. That's it's a pretty cool solo. It's, really, it's a little difficult. I mean, it's a finger twister in a way, but it's cool. Yeah. Really no, cool. He's, and wasn't he – how about this, like, thing? I first was aware of the – um the uh, Yeah. The Randy Rubs. That yeah. little, uh, Randy. But we also have – The Journey one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Right, like, like, um, it's like right around the same time. Uh-huh. Right, right, right. I mean, that, that shape, that shape, that. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. That little thing, you know. Now Randy descended with it, but like Neil's, what? Isn't that funny? Yeah. I don't know. Came out in 1980. When did uh, Don't Stop Believing come out? It's like wasn't that 81? Yeah, there's a lot of sharing going on. You know, they were always talking about like Purple Rain and faithfully all kind of and in heaven inspiring the other one and then on heaven you've got steve smith playing the drums which not a lot of people realize that but he did wow. that session yeah and that's why you hear all those great tom rolls in heaven it's steve smith <laughs> wait, wait, have it, wait but we were in heaven was that brian adams, brian adams yeah. Yeah, yeah 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 oh that's steve smith yeah <laughs> oh awesome oh here's one here's one this chord what does this chord sound like Diary, yeah. Diary. Right. Okay, opening a diary. But doesn't it sound like? Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Or the actually, what's the next chord? Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, then he yeah. goes. Uh, I don't remember. It. Uh, oh yeah. Oh yeah, that one. Yeah. Yeah. Come on, man! That diary cord's in there. <laughs> right. But I'm saying, like, I, I've I've talked to others. So one of my friends, I'm like, come on, isn't there a chance that somebody, like, come on, Randy, those records are big. Randy's killing it. That maybe he just somebody said, check out the intro of this this piece, this Randy Ozzy thing, Diary of a Man, and Eddie was like, whoa, that you know, because that's I don't know how often do you hear this chord. Well, my well, you heard that story. Oh, there, there's a story now. There's a story about the diary album. And this is, I, I've seen this multiple times on the net, but Randy's at Tower Records and it turns out Eddie's in front of him and Eddie's buying Diary of the Madman. Oh, I've heard that story. On. I've heard that a few times. I How reliable of a source is that? I don't know, but it's the internet talk. I mean, you know, it's, I've heard it a couple of times over the years, but yeah, that's what it was. Well, sometimes things, sometimes things are accurate and sometimes they're not, you know, it's not like everything <laughs> on the internet is uh, the truth or a lie, but internet wow, talk. Um, that'd be wild though, right? You know, and, and, and who knows, but like, why, like, I don't know, it was 1980 and, uh, or 81. When eighty one, when Diary came out. Well, think about it, to eighty two. But think about it when, um, you know, he was a big fan of Sabbath. So why wouldn't he buy Ozzy's new album? Well, ex exactly. And it's not like you can. The thing is, yeah, you pretty much do have to go buy a record. You, if you want to hear what's going on, you can't just. Nobody's got cell phones. There's no <laughs> internet. That's right. what we all forget so quickly. You go, oh, like when my first stance was, oh, how reliable is that, Eddie Van Halen? in Tower Records buying Diary of Madman and Randy's like, yeah, dude, they all, we all had to go to record stores to buy our music. <laughs> right. right, we had to. I mean, you know, it could have happened. I don't know for sure, but that's, I've seen it multiple times over the years, people saying this story and I'm like, you know, there's a lot of stories about Eddie too, like when he would be like going to Guitar Center, you hear like stories of him teaching people on the fly, like how to play something, just grab some kid. <laughs> that's that's a you know, you hear those all the time from like uh, Sherman Oaks. There's that the guitar center there. And apparently yeah. he would drop in there and somebody would be playing something. He would surprise them and like show them how to play whatever they were trying to play of his and crazy stuff. I mean, how, how, how cool is that to, to be Eddie Van Halen and go, you know what? It's not even like I'm being Mr. Know-it-all. When I come in, I'm Eddie Van Halen. I, I, I mean, I'd be a fool to not know that I'm pretty much one of the world's best guitar players and most loved guitar player in rock and most groundbreaking. So if I walk in a guitar center and I hear somebody do it, a, a lick, you know, I can go, hey, man, you should, should. And they're not like, oh, who do you think you are? It's like, oh, you're actually Eddie Van Halen in there. Apparently it was, it's a, all cool. it's like, it was a kid, right? And his dad was there and the kid, the kid, showed, he showed the kid and he walked out and then the dad, dad goes, 
The kid goes, who is that? And he points at this big picture of Eddie Van Halen on the wall. I don't know if somebody enhanced the story, but that's what the story was. The other story is that he went in there one day and somebody said something about, I need a mic for, you know, mic in my guitar cabinet. Eddie happened to be standing close. And he goes, well, why don't you ask him? And Eddie goes, SM57? And so the kid doesn't realize it's Eddie Van Halen, right? And he, he, Eddie buys him the mic, right? So the oh, yeah. kid, kid gets the mic, goes home. Next day, he brings it back and trades it in. <laughs> Why? I don't know. But that was the story. First of all, you don't you don't ever sell anything that Eddie Van Halen or trade it in that you got bought, gifted, and bought right. by Eddie Van Halen. Right. Wow. Interesting. Baby? Yeah, oh, I did. Want, I did want to want to say I forgot like a. Back in when I was when I was playing with Slash with Eric Dover and stuff, yeah, yeah. Um, we we did a bunch of festivals in in Europe in '95, and it was Van Halen Bon Jovi festivals. So there would be like you know Rock and Ring and whatever. Yeah, we, just different festivals. We just talked about that with Phil because Phil, I guess Phil Phil was aware that they played with him in '95, but it wasn't like something hugely on his radar. But I, I knew about it, of course, and I I knew that Bon Jovi was the headliner. Yeah, but yeah, Van, and and of course I was like, well, I don't get it. But 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 Bon Jovi had gotten really really huge. Van Halen was huge, but at that point, Bon Jovi was just bigger. But it didn't matter. We were, I was just like, dude, whatever. We're playing. I'm playing with Slash. This is great. We're and we're playing with Van Halen. Um, but I had my um, Diver Down tour book in my suitcase because I knew we were going to be. I had brought it. I had not yet gotten into the routine of calling my mom in Jersey and go mail out my whatever records, you know, like, like Kiss or Van Halen or Aerosmith because I'm going to go somewhere where those guys are or whatever. Like on the Kiss cruise, I had a bunch of the Kiss ones signed, but she'd mail them out, you know, because they're all sitting in her basement. Yeah. You know? But anyways, um, I did have my Diver Down tour book with me or something. So I brought, it was in my suitcase. I Maybe I met Alex quickly once. And, and then the second time, there's a whole bunch of people I remember saying, Maybe I just met him then, and I said, "I have my diver down tour book in my suitcase. Next time you meet, I'll, I'll, can can you sign it?" He's like, "Yeah, man, cool." But I that didn't happen. I don't think I met Eddie then. Um, but after these shows we did, I don't remember. There's a few festivals. I don't know if it was ten, two, five. It's probably a few of them. Um, a few months later, we got the uh, opportunity to open up two. Van Halen shows just slash a snake pit opening up for Van Halen. Yeah. It was only two. So it wasn't like we were going to be on the tour. It was like two California shows. I can't they remember. They were. That's, yeah. You know what? Eric mentioned that. He mentioned those particular two dates you're talking about. Yeah. So, but I was like, cool. Now, b back then, I had this leady snare drum that I've had since I was like nine years old and got rid of the leady kit, but they didn't want the snare drum. And then I, sat in the garage i fixed it up when i fixed it back up in college it had this really great tone it's the snare drum i use in the i'm the one video that we talked about and it's got a distinct honk bonk throat tone to it and I, I, when i set it up i was like wow this thing's loud it's got a tone so i used it for years recorded with it toured with it I, so in 95 that was my drum like i was i wouldn't borrow any if i was renting drums I, whatever man i'm bringing my leady so I remember, like, I don't know Van Halen guys. Like, I'm not, there's, it's like, I'm in the arena at my drums. We're just opening up two shows. But I was like, God, I would, I remember messing, like, after soundcheck, tuning my leady a little bit. And I saw Alex walking somewhere. I was like, oh, what if he heard my snare drum and liked the sound and came over? You know, it was like, because I'm so into Alex's sound. But I was like, I just didn't want to bother. Like, I don't want to bother anybody. You know, we're just the opening band. Right. Um, so we didn't even talk then for those two shows. And that snare drum was just lost, uh, was stolen, lost, whatever, in my suitcase that landed at LAX that they say did arrive. And it had um, a whole bunch of stuff from a record I did in Vancouver. And I came home and the snare drum was in there because I wanted to record using that drum because I wanted to get you know, a certain tone. Um, so that drum since has been, uh, is gone forever. Um, but since then I've bought some other, it's because it's from the 60s. And it was a specific, specific snare drum when Slingerland owned Leedy for a certain amount of years in the 60s. And uh, um, so anyways, I've, I've been getting some other old ones trying to find that tone. And I have some good ones. But this one, maybe because I had the edges re-beveled or whatever. But I, I, I'm still working on it. It's a work in progress. 
But this is like all these thoughts I'm talking about are because of of guys like Alex with his snare sound. That sure. I just so that means so much to me. So, but anyways, when we did this show, um, th th there's two cool things. One interesting thing, one cool thing. Um, we're about to play the show. I've run in the, you know, because you're traveling all day, you're traveling. So I'm like, I always try to take a shower before the show. If I'm not in a hotel, then I'll take it at the gig or whatever, because I wake up and I'm clean. I'm like ready, to, like I'm a little more focused. I'm like, okay, I showered, I'm, I'm awake and I'm alert. So I take a shower in the, in the backstage and we're probably going on like 30 minutes or whatever. And I come out of the dressing room, uh, the, the bathroom, and I'm, you know, slash the guys are in the dressing room. And I just got a towel on. And I'm thinking it's just us in the band. I open the door, and right in front of me are Sammy and Eddie talking to Slash. And they turn around, look at me, and I was like, all wet with a dri dripping wet with a towel on. I'm like, oh, this sucks. Like, I don't want to meet you. Like, <laughs> so I, think I, I just went, uh, hey. And I think they both said hi, and Slash was talking to him, but it was just like, dude, we don't even know you, and you're just getting out of the shower. And now we're like, it was just a little weird. So it wasn't like I was dressed and walked into the backstage, and they were like, Oh, this is Brian, the drummer. Hey, I, it was like, I just, it was just weird. So it kind of sucked. I was like, damn, man, why couldn't I just be dressed when they came in so I could hang out? And I'm sitting here, I got to change. I got to go back in the bathroom. You know, um, and then before one of those shows, uh, Gilby and I, Gilby was playing you know, guitar in the band as well. I think maybe he knew Michael Anthony already because right before the show, this was really cool. He brought me up to Michael Anthony's little side stage hang area. We all did a shot of Jack together, which I was like, you know, that was just, just cool to be able to say I was on Van Halen stage and a shot of Jack with Michael, you know. <laughs> so, but that was, that was all, that was just good stuff. But that came and went too quickly. You know, that was like, just, you know, you're in an arena open for Van Halen. There's only so much time. And, you, you know, it's like, who am I? I don't want to bother. That's always the thing. You don't want to bother anybody. You know, I want to, I want to get like, have that opportunity to be able to, to be seen as a musician and prove myself and 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 know you on more of that level than rather just like get in your face because i happen to be in your world alex i'm brian the opening drummer can you come over here can you dip it and sign this it's just like dude you know like they get this all the time so i'd rather it you right. know work its way into that and more personal yeah you know that 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 is you know it's something like i think that like for me you know having a chance to meet Eddie, you know, the only time I got to meet him was at the Smithsonian when they did that. I was at that, that event, but you know, he was right. a lot relaxed that night and, and it was a little more personal than, than probably anything. I mean, he, you know, he didn't do meet and greets really. I mean, if yeah. you, at NAM, it was like some kind of crazy, you know, you know, nutty thing at NAM. And that's why I think he had so much trouble with his anxiety, man. You, I mean, you know, you were just talking about being Eddie Van Halen and what that'd be like to be at NAM. Get, you know, I used to yeah, watch it go down. It was like, oh, dude, it was a, yeah. It, the pictures are one thing in the magazine, selling records, going on tour, and all that stuff. But then MTV, nineteen eighty four, like think of that. This huge record, huge tour, huge videos. Then after that, all the other, it's just like. Like, you know, Van Halen was already huge up to Diver Down. Like, they were already huge. But, like, MTV changed so much. You know, I, mean, I, I loved MTV. I thought it was great. I didn't understand why we didn't just have a freaking station that plays videos all the time and does some music news. Like, dude, that's cool. You know, mm -hmm. it, it, you didn't know what was next. But, uh, yeah, but they just got bigger and bigger in the video world. So he's just – everybody – you know what I mean? He's got – he's getting hit from so many angles. Like, the rock star – the guitar hero, you know, um, it's just, that's a lot to take on, you know, uh, uh, you know, the, the rock star who looks the good looking guy looks the part, you know what I mean? It's like, there's just so, every kid, every guitar kid wants to be you and, uh, you know, and uh, is it, is it, it's, it's like, you know, to this day, every, you know, Van Halen tribute band, every, you know, you got to find the guy that, you know, he's got a look. That's an image. It's a total rock god image, you know? Something yes. like him, Randy Rhodes, Jimmy Page, Jimmy Hendrix. You know, God. He, he so was a guy that way. Man. I tell you what, he was – so you, did you work – you were with Sash Jordan, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. I've, I've uh, played on a record with – I've known Sash a long time. Played on a, her record called Rats, and um, then we, we did a little project band called Something Unto Nothing with me on guitar. Well, I mean, I'm on drums in the studio, but uh, it was – her and I writing. We did a whole record together a bunch of years ago. Really the reason, cool, you know, more hard rock and stuff. The reason I was asking is because they're, they're, she 
had wrote a, a story about the Van Halen's, I think after his passing or whatever, but she had spent some time at 5150. Did you ever talk to her about that? Oh yeah. She told me the whole thing a long time ago and she, she acted like she, she didn't, I don't know. We were just hanging out. I didn't realize like three weeks later, they wanted me to like possibly sing in their band. I'm like, what'd you think they were doing? Like, <laughs> but she'd say she would also, they would be telling her, They'd be hanging out and they'd, they'd have her go down to the store to get the booze, get the beer and stuff. Because yeah. either they weren't, I don't know if they weren't, if they were trying not to, I don't think it was a not drinking thing. I think it was like just not getting bothered. They'd right. have her go get the booze so the Van Halen's wouldn't have to be seen publicly and deal with it. But she just, she was there for week, like weeks hanging out. She said, she said in her post, I think it was a post, she said that, that um, Eddie, she would say, well, why don't you want to, I don't want to go down there by myself at night you know go with me and and he was like you don't understand <laughs> i can't just go yeah, down no. to ralph's or whatever right so he goes and apparently as soon as he gets down there in the middle of the night he's still you got a line of people or whatever <laughs> at the grocery store and she goes he yeah. goes on the way back he goes i told you <laughs> You're like i told you it was gonna be like this her well her thing was she didn't really get that they were considering her you know yeah, as a singer and she was just hanging out you know just hanging out with uh eddie and alex you know this would have been, this would have been probably the gary sharon or after era i think it was before gary okay so they were yeah, still fast came out man she's like i remember seeing one of her videos be on the record before i worked with her and i was like that she's got a great voice i mean she has she has a badass voice she is a she's a badass rock singer and uh that would have been interesting. I mean, I, I could she have? Yeah, could she, she's 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 a badass. Like, <laughs> would people have wanted it? I, I don't know. Who cares? Like, if 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 Eddie and Alice were like, let's try it. I well, don't know, know if she sang anything recorded with them. That's you what know, I you know. It was all it goes goes back to the Patty Smite thing, you know, where they thought about putting her right. In, right. I mean, well, there you go. There, there you go. Like that, you know. And I think Sass has a more distinct voice, you know, right. than Patty. Right. Mike, for that I think for that just, yeah. yeah. Let me ask you a couple of things to close up. One, one would be, you know, just the day you found out about his passing, where were you, and you know, how did you take it in? Oh, no, I, I it's like most people. I'm like, I was, uh, I was home. I was, I was home, but uh, it was like it was similar to like like a, a similar to Neil, Neil Peart. And it was like, and that was what's what, it, that's what made it worse was because it's like, oh man, this, this again with, like I said to you, for me, it's like been, it's been like Peart, Paige, Tyler, Eddie and Alex, uh, like, like that's the top for me, you know, of course there's McCartney, of course there's, you know, Angus, whatever. But, but I'm just saying like those, those guys, you know, so when I, you know, when you, when it's a, a, a Neil Peart or an Eddie Van Halen and you get that news, I, I was just like, oh, yeah, come on, man. Like, it just, you, you feel empty. You know what I mean? You feel empty because, because there's always this little hope. Like, even if I never meet him again or anything like that, it was just like, just, it's been such a big part of your life. He doesn't know it. He's a big part of so many people's lives. But it's just like, he's just cool. He's cool and he's always going to do something like what that's going to inspire you and you never know what he's going to do. And I guess just for me in my little world, because I have met some of my idols and played with some of them and all that stuff, it's really, it's pretty amazing feeling, you know, like I, like I don't have my own band where I got some big single or that kind of success. Like, like we all, I think that's what I thought it was all about. Start your own band, you know, the next Van Halen you know rush zeppelin maiden acc whatever that's your that's your thing man that's what you do you know everything else is whatever that's your thing but um that's not the easiest thing in the world you know to to, to do that and it's on especially on a level of like the bands i mentioned you know so when you do get to meet these affected you so heavily you know you go man that would be like uh be amazing if there was uh you know a chance that i'd work with them again because those are just really huge moments in somebody's life you know if you, if if uh to get that opportunity that you because it seems so far 
fetched from any kind of reality in your life, you know, especially growing up as a kid, buy the ticket, go to the arena, which when I saw Van Halen diver down the day of the show, the night before is when he broke his wrist and that show was postponed and I had to wait a freaking month. I had just already wait, waited a month. It's like, today's the day. And my buddy goes, oh, man, I thought he's messing me. Van Halen shows canceled. They broke his wrist. Just heard it on the radio. I'm like, I'm like, screw you, man. He's just trying to start me up. Then I go home and I hear it. I'm like, are you kidding me? This was the <laughs> biggest night of my year. This was the night to see Van Halen. This, and I can't go now. I got to wait 30 days. Oh, my God. So when we went back and saw when we, when we did go and watch it, was just, it was just so – it was just too much. It was too much to be – like it was, it was the, the kiss – Rush, Van Halen, being in those rooms with those, those bands, when I'm like, that's them. That, that's them as a physical human being on this planet. That's too much. They're not just a picture. They're not just on TV. You know, it's not just on a record. You know, so, so when it's somebody like that and he's not here, you're just like, man, um, uh, that's it. That's it. You, you have, you, that's, that's, that's it with him here, you know, and what he left is amazing. I can, for the rest of my life, uh, that's still not enough time to enjoy and dig in the way I want to because it's just fun to learn and to get better from uh, listening to somebody like Eddie Van Halen. You know, the, ins the inspiration is always there. It's constant. I mean, there's like, it's like not a day that goes by that I don't think, it's like Bonham Snare. There's certain things in my head that just come in and out constantly. <laughs> it's just always there, you know? And uh, Eddie's one of those things. It's always been. Uh, yeah, so I was, just, I was just, yeah, I just feel empty. I think that's the, the easy, you just like there's something that's like oh man you know it's, it's like you, you, you like you know like if your house was broken into and a bunch of shit, you know, shit that meant something you just gone like okay it's gone i know this is those are just like items but it, this is a being but he's more than just it's more than just a human that i happen to meet this is like what he represented on this planet is now now he's not here. Like it's all talk. It's all what we're doing now, right, as right. opposed to, you know, yeah. It's, it's it was it was just really sad. It it just leaves leaves you with this little bit of a hole, you know. Like like I said, there's this little emptiness, and it's like, well, I, you know, uh, he and I have you know we have that one little blip in time, you know. But but uh, just because, you know. Yeah, that's that's what life is, man. When it's over, you know, no nobody, you know, you, that's it's a heavy thing. You know, it's just like it represents, uh, you know, it just puts it puts that final freaking thing. It's just it's done, you know, mm -hmm. and we all you all got to move on, and uh, it just but it doesn't. I don't know. Maybe just try. I'm having a hard hard time explaining because maybe it's just like knowing that he was in Coldwater Canyon, knowing the fifty one fifty is there, knowing that I actually got through that gate and made music with this guy, like <laughs> played music and spent some time with this, per you know, maybe, maybe because it's, it was that close. You think, Oh, maybe something like that could, you know, happen again down the road. Well, that's not, and that's, that's not even like how I looked at it when I first thought about it, but that's just more like, that's how final it is. You know, it just sucked. You know, it's, um, you know, that I tripped out when I heard Taylor Hawkins, I was like, I've known Taylor. He replaced me in the Sass Jordan band, you know, before Alanis Morissette or uh, Foo Fighter stuff, you know. And we met back then uh, mm -hmm. when I was playing with Zach Wilde and he was playing with Sass and we were all opening up for Aerosmith in Europe. And uh, and we were friends. We, we didn't stay like close friends or any stuff like that, but we met back then and played shows together. And uh, the house I used to live at, he used to come over and um, – friends with the guitar player stevie salas that you know was that i was playing with and that was what got me in with sass and that's you know stevie got taylor and sass's thing so it's just like wait i haven't seen i i was like i know i'm gonna see taylor again i'm gonna see him somewhere you know what i mean i the last i don't know the last time i saw him one of the last times was at one of the van halen friends and family things at the forum you mm -hmm. know we were both there and uh it was just like damn wait that's that's not right he's what are you talking about He's not here. It's man. It's crazy. You know, man. he's a big, yeah, just like, huge, huge fan too. I mean, Taylor just wore Van Halen on his sleeve and everywhere else, like we do. <laughs> I mean, you know what I mean? Yeah. Oh, yeah. totally. I remember. I remember telling. I think I got a, a, a Zoso tattoo, and I was like, I remember. Just play, I think we were playing with Billy Idol, me and Shirini. And I go, Derek, I'm gonna get Zoso. 
I will pay if you get the Van Halen 2 logo on your arm. Come on, man. Get a Van Halen tat. Van Halen 2. And he's like, no, man. Like, you did. Come on. You're like the big his, – his, son his son's name is Halen. Son's oh, name Halen. What the hell? <laughs> I got but, one. But, there you yeah, go. <laughs> he's, it's awesome. But he's but he's not a you know he's not a tattoo guy and I'm not even a tattoo guy I don't even, I don't either. Know but I, that's bad. Anyway, when I got one, I was like, yeah. "What are we gonna put on there?" Well, I know what the only one thing that I want to be buried with on my arm, and that's it. <laughs> yeah. Oh man. But, but uh, yeah. They, they, but yeah, that that's it. Was just it's just a bummer, you know. I mean, I, somebody else can probably explain those kind of feelings better than me. I just just feel just feel empty. It feels like the world is just not as cool of a place anymore it's just dude, that's how special he was you, you know? said you said a second ago you know like you you you, you think about him was that he you knew he would come up with something new and amazing and when i was going through those first you know five albums or so when i went through those albums with every little i got it i got used to the whole thing where he's gonna have a little solo spot and they're gonna have the little rothisms and you, yeah. Every album, it like that progressed. They they kept adding to this soup that they were making, and it was like, oh man, what are they gonna do next? And that was like, you always felt like that with Eddie. Oh yeah, oh I I I, I was so happy. Well, yeah, Th yeah, I totally thought the same thing too. And the only place is Women and Children First, where it, it's the fool's little bit, mm -hmm. where he gives you. He had already done it, and somebody get me a doctor. What he, you know, the, he does the trill, but he palm mutes, so it's it's the harmonics, you know. This he he did it, and somebody gave me a doctor, but you know, on the reintro when they come back in, and you're no good. He it's really clear there, but I didn't pick up on that as much as I did um, when he did it in, in the full solo. So I thought that was the special thing then. Maybe I, no, that's because I had one of those first before I had Van Halen too. So I'd heard that first. I was like, because uh, I knew about Spanish Fly. But yeah, there was always something. Except I wish there was a little bit more on Women and Children first with the, uh, with the guitar, something with the guitar inventive yeah, stuff. Yeah. But right. man, I love little guitars. When he did the freaking, the, 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 the acoustic, uh, the, right, right, right. the classical guitar. Right, the, right. well, that's like, like I said, another example of every little album that had some kind of thing. Even like, well, you're saying Women and Children first, and could, could this be magic earlier, you know? All that slide on acoustic, you know. That well, yeah, that was that was cool. That was totally cool. But I guess as a younger kid, I was way. I just well, wait, that but... wasn't much different. I guess because Spanish Fly was just ripping, dude. Just he was just ripping on that. Sure. But uh, yeah, and then he had Hopper Teacher, the uh, Hopper Teacher intro on um, on uh, 1984. Then he did the stuff. What was it? The Steinberger. He had that stuff on 5150 where it's Steve, you do the Wang bar, but it would stay in tune. That is cool, man. That was cool. He, yeah, he did continue, even though he was with Hagar, he did continue to evolve and do different things that, that were, you know, that, that still stick, you know, that are still in his, his repertoire of crazy inventions and. Yeah, was, was, was 316, was that on OU812? Uh, that was on the Fuck album. Oh, and what then is, what album is the drill on? What album is the no? Okay. Wait, do, 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 do. Okay. What? same album. What? Pound cake. Was wait, I think three, three sixteen is on. Really? I think it is on. Uh, I think they're both on that. But <laughs> wasn't he playing that in his live solo on? Uh, OU812 tour? Bo, 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 bo. Might have been, but you know, he, I think he, you know, how he always did stuff like, you know, you played the whole You're No Good thing. Um, You know, there there was that, you know, the tapping thing where he does, it's sort of like a, it's sort of like a classical thing that he does that he, he'd been doing it for a long time, but I thought it was like a later thing, like 86 on or maybe 84 maybe, but I saw that video that just came out of 80. And the solos in it. It's a real clean video. Oh, you mean where he always hits the theme? Like he holds the note at the top. He was doing it in 80. He was doing it in 80, you know. He was doing it way back. And he was combining combining the you're no good stuff with it or kind of around it. So maybe that's it. Maybe I saw it. Would he have I'd have to check it out. He might have been doing it doing them earlier, but live, you know. Maybe that was it. Maybe he played the the the, the three three sixteen live, and then 
it was she was jamming it live as part of a solo and then named it and put it on the next record i Maybe think so was. i think so i, I think you know, I, I should like, know this there's so many things I, like I that though that I don't know that I don't know the, the Sammy era every like record every song like I just I I had I bought fifty one fifty you know you eight one two and I listened to them when they came out on cassette yeah. okay. and I really really you know as, as I also bought Even Smile and um and uh, I, I like the the those two I like the Hagar stuff better now than maybe I did because I wanted to hear I didn't. I was just more, more. I was always more on the heavier side. The bands, I wanted my bands, like the bands I like to be, like, on the more like on the heavier side, you know. But but I but you can't deny a good hook or good melody. It's just uh, it was just it just got a little bit polished. Yeah, yeah. Um, in with Sammy, which kind of makes sense because it's a whole new thing. And uh, but Alex still throughout all of it. He always sounded like a badass motherfucker. Man. Always, Wait, uh, always. Let me ask you this about the tone of the drums on uh, on 